Thanks to the International Network on Personal Meaning and the British Columbia Family Council for sponsoring this. It's a great honor to be associated with these groups and also to, to speak with Dr. Gabarino tonight. I also thank all of you for giving me the gift of your time on a beautiful July evening in British Columbia. It's a great honor to have your time. And I hope I'm worthy of that honor because it's really tough to compete with a beautiful night in this particular place. I'm, from, I'm here with my husband and we're from Nebraska where it's probably about 97 degrees Fahrenheit right now. It's very, very hot and flat. And I cannot tell you how magical the mountains and the ocean and the cool air are to us this time of year. Just for my own curiosity, how many of you have read Reviving Ophelia? Okay. I, I published that book in 94, and I, it was reissued uh, last year with an interview uh, by my daughter, who was in Ophelia when I wrote it, and is now 25 and, and living in D.C. And um, I think it was about maybe the 50th edition. I can tell you this because... Um, I have to say, that book is not about me. Um, it's about something so much bigger than me. And there's almost a sense in which I don't even feel like I wrote that book. It's, it's just sort of gone on to have a life of its own. And I actually feel like the Times wrote that book, that I happened to catch a wave, and the wave was globalization. The wave was all over the world, teenagers were being socialized by boxes, by television, stereos, computers, CDs, and that all over the world, parents, teachers, and therapists felt they were somehow losing control of that socialization process. And the experiences I was having as a, as a mom, as a therapist in Lincoln, Nebraska, just happened to be the same problems every other mom was having all over the world at that point. Um, and for example, a couple of things since then have really, when I wrote that book, I almost thought, this book is so local. It's so about my little private practice in Southeast Lincoln, Nebraska. And um, since then, I've really uh, had a very different point of view on that. For example, I went to Poland. I went to Warsaw. I was invited there by the Polish ambassador's wife. And what happened, the way she described what happened to Poland after the Iron Curtain fell was she said it took us 50 years to get rid of the communists and then the Marlboro Man rode into town. And they weren't prepared in that country for advertising, for consumerism, and particularly their teenagers started having a lot of trouble. So they invited a group of American psychologists to come and speak with government leaders and, and teachers, educators, and media people about the effects on families of commercialism. So I was over there. I landed at the Warsaw Airport. And as I was riding into town, I saw a, a sort of a big copper tone-esque uh, banner advertising something with a skinny model. And when I got to the hotel, the first thing that happened was a couple Polish therapists came up to me and said, we have eating disorders now in Warsaw. We've never had those as a problem. And now we need some help with eating disorders. I was also in Burma. I'd gone to Thailand to visit my daughter who was, was studying there. And we went into Burma. And Probably most of you know this, but Burma's a terrible place, has a terrible military government. And as we crossed into Burma, the, it, it's just it's a, a really a horrifying experience because the people's eyes are, are dead. There's just no hope in anyone's eyes. And so we were walking around this kind of tawdry border market, feeling just the weight of Burma as, as we walked around this place. And um, we came to a stand that was selling beach towels to tourists. And all of the beach towels were emblazoned with the figures of Leonardo DiCaprio 
and Madonna. So even in Burma, that's who was on the beach towels. If I updated Reviving Ophelia, if I were writing it today, I'd include more on, on certain issues than I did then. I've now had the, the luxury of several years to think about that book and what was good about it, what I wish I'd done more. I'd certainly put in more on immigrant and refugee and minority teenagers. My practice was a very white practice when I wrote this book, and I'm, I'm much less oriented toward people who look like me than I was at the time I wrote this book. I'd also have more in there on computers, because amazingly in 94 in Nebraska, computers were not a part of the lives of the average teenager, nor were cell phones. Teenagers didn't have cell phones in 94. I'd put in more on violence, because the book was actually written pre-school shootings and Columbine, and more on um, the pressure on kids to be consumers. You know, the, the branding of children, the channel one in the schools, product placement in everything, and um, the sort of the pressure on children from 18 months old to be part of our, to turn their dreams into shopping goals is a kind of shorthand way to say it. On the other hand, there's some ways I'm much more optimistic than I was then. First of all, optimism is a point of view, a matter of point of view. And when I wrote the book, I was doing therapy. I was seeing one casualty of our culture's policies after another. And, and now what I do is I, I do a lot of community work. I, I go places where people have mobilized to help families and teenagers. So I'm seeing a lot of the solutions to the problems in action. So that's one point of view difference. The other big difference is when I wrote that book, my own children were teenagers. And now they're not teenagers, they're grown-ups, which has given me the perspective that teenage, that adolescence is, in fact, a time-related illness that does eventually go away. Since that book, I've written The Shelter of Each Other in Another Country and Middle of Everywhere. And what all the books have in common is I'm very interested in how culture affects mental health. And this last book that I'm going to talk about tonight, Middle of Everywhere, really looks at how globalization is affecting us all. And again, it's focused on my town, Lincoln, Nebraska, but I think the issues are the issues all of us are facing as we have increasingly a world where we're all mixed together. Lincoln is an official refugee resettlement community. That means that refugees from all over the world, if they're allowed into the US, they, they usually land in New York City at JFK. They're met by an immigration officer and handed a plane ticket to Lincoln, Nebraska, in many cases. Most of them have no idea where Nebraska is. They have no choice about coming there. In fact, a fairly common mistake of the refugees is they think Nebraska is Alaska. They think they hear the word Alaska, and they expect to see polar bears and igloos when they land. And of course, depending on the time of year, they can continue to think they're in Alaska for some time. Like refugees anywhere in the world, they arrive in our town broke, traumatized, overwhelmed. And the older they are, the harder it is. And the more different their culture, the harder it is for them to get used to our town. Now, what I did to research this book, I did a variety of things. I offered myself as a free therapist to any refugee who wanted to see, see me in therapy. And I would go to their house and, and drive to their place and see them. And you may want to ask a few questions about this in the question and answer period, because that was a very interesting experience in itself. I spent a year at the elementary school. I started with kids from 52 different countries. We have Croatian, Bosnian, Afghan, Russian, Vietnamese, Somalian, Nigerian, kids from the Cameroon and Sierra Leone and so on. I started in September with a group of kids who spoke no English and followed them a year. 
And amazingly, by the end of a year, those kids speak English. I mean, they are quick. Their brains are quick, and they pick up language very, very rapidly. I also spent a year in the high school, and I entitled that the chapter I wrote about the high school, Muhammad Meets Madonna, because we have a big 3,000-kid high school that really has a lot of interesting cultural collisions between the American kids and the refugees and between many of the refugee groups. One of my favorite projects at the school, by the way, was in the ESL class I was in for a year. They discussed the book, they read and discussed the book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Do any of you know that book? It's a book about transformation. It turned out to be a very relevant book um, for the lives of these kids. I also spent a lot of time with people in their 20s, most of whom were factory workers, and I entitled that chapter, Is There a Marriage Broker in Lincoln? Because one of the things that's happened, we have many people from traditional cultures in our town, and cultures that value virginity, value the honor of women. The honor of women stands for the honor of the family. They also, in many cases, come from places where there's no traditions of dating or courtship, where women don't even necessarily speak to men that are outside of their family. So they come to Lincoln, they don't have parents to arrange their marriages, they don't know how to date, a lot of strange misunderstandings, some funny, some not so funny, arise when they maybe venture into the, even for us native-born Americans, treacherous world of dating. But, but a very common thing that happened to me would be as I got to know a refugee at some point, he or she would say to me, can you find me a husband? Can you find me a wife? And I would always have to say no, although I have to confess I was tempted a few times to do some matchmaking, but I didn't. I'd always say no. And then the follow-up question one time from a man was, where are the marriage brokers in Lincoln? Where are the marriage brokers? We could actually use some marriage brokers in our town. I uh, also was part of a project, a mental health project called Thrive, which was originally conceived as several of us clinical psychologists would get together a representative from each culture. We would teach them about our Western mental health culture, and then they could go back to the Bosnian culture, the Lao culture, the uh, Nigerian culture, or the, the uh, Sudanese culture, whatever, and teach them about Western mental health. But very early in that project, we realized we had totally misconceived what that project should be. And that what, in fact, it should be is we should ask them to teach us about their cultures and how they dealt with um, pain in their cultures, how they dealt with domestic disputes, how they dealt with people who hurt their families, who drank too much, who were depressed and couldn't leave the home to go to work, and so on. And so we stopped teaching and started being, asking questions and listening, and it became a, mu a much more profound project. But probably our best and our best learning experiences involved, we, um, my husband and I befriended three families and became what I call in the book their cultural brokers. The first family was a family of four siblings from the Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya. They're called in the U.S. the Lost Boys of Kakuma. I don't particularly like that. They don't like to be referred to as lost. They're not boys. They're, they're, they're mostly men now. And there's also girls or women in the group. So it's not a very good name. But Kakuma is the refugee camp they came from. But our family, Joseph, the oldest brother, was 12 when his par their parents were killed. They walked first with a group of about 30,000 other orphaned kids in a kind of reverse Lord of the Flies. They, they banded together, helped each other. They walked to a refugee camp in Ethiopia. They were there for a very short time. The Ethiopian government changed hands. The new government didn't want them. So they sent soldiers with bayonets to this camp full of kids. They drove them across a river. And, and while they were swimming across the river, crocodiles showed up. 
So our family made it because they were kind of in the front, but the further back the kids were, the more likely they were to be eaten by crocodiles. So several thousand kids lost their lives in that river. Then they walked again back across the Sudan and ended up in a uh, refugee camp in Kenya where by the time we met our family, they'd been in this camp for eight years surviving on a bowl of lentils a day. And they came to Lincoln on Christmas Day um, about 18 months ago. The first thing that happened to them was they fell down the stairs at the escalator, at, or the escalators at our airport. And um, they were very, they were very unprepared for America. We had them over to our house. Here's a funny story because there's so many sad stories about them. But one of the first things we did was have them over to our house. And um, we have one of those fireplaces that you can push a button and it makes a fire. So they were amazed by that fireplace. They kept pushing that button, looking at the artificial fire. Wow, you can turn a fire on, you can turn a fire off, looking for the smoke, trying to figure out how we put wood in this. And the other thing we did that day was we gave them hot chocolate with marshmallows in it, very American thing. And boy, they did not like marshmallows. They were very polite, but you could tell by their faces, they did not think the marshmallow was a food. It was something very bad to them. But um, this family, they had learned, it was interesting, in the camp, the boys had been able to go to school. And they had been taught in the camp to say, education is our mother and our father. And so one of the very rewarding things was to take all the kids but Joseph to school. Joseph was too old. The sister, Martha, because she was a girl, had not been allowed to go to school. She'd been expected to just cook and clean and do tasks in this camp. And it was very rewarding to take her to school. She and her brother were so cold that day because it was below zero on Lincoln. They're sitting in this bright American school. They have their stocking caps and their gloves on that we gave them. They're just, the eyes are wide from how strange and difficult it is for them to understand the school. And the teacher's going through the list of classes and he's going, Martha, you can take piano, you can learn to read. And it was a very satisfying moment to realize these kids will get to be in school in our country. So that's one family. Another family um, was a couple, Mohammed and Bintu, from Sierra Leone, which um, Bintu called the worstest place on earth. And what had happened to them, one thing that I, I want to mention about them, because a lot of times when we see images of refugees on TV, we see these bedraggled, beat up people which I think enables us to distance from them and go, well, they're not like us because we're clean and we're educated and, and we're somehow different than these, these people we see on TV that look so victim-like. But Mohammed and Bintu are a very good example of how middle-class people can get caught up in this very quickly and, and their lives all of a sudden are different. Mohammed had been a foreign exchange student to Austria and Bintu was a soccer star at her private school. They were both from, from prosperous families. But when the war came to Sierra Leone, Mohammed's fa family, who lived in a village, um, his sisters were all killed. They were raped to death, is his phrase. And his, his brothers and parents were hung. And then Bintu, they lived in Freetown. And Bintu made her living going around buying cloth from the native women. But, um, and she'd been warned, the rebels are kidnapping people who pick up this cloth, don't drive. But she knew if she didn't drive, these women wouldn't have any money to buy milk and rice and things for their kids. So she kept going, and she ended up being kidnapped by the rebels. So she was with the rebels eight months. Then when the rebels invaded Freetown, they used her as a human shield. She was... Uh, Part of that, that terrible day in Freetown where 6,000 people were, had their hands and feet chopped off, just a day out of Dante's Inferno. And during that day, she and Mohammed's three kids disappeared. The kids had been with Mohammed. So it was a very bad day. Bintu escaped. Mohammed escaped the city without the kids. They were gone. He had no idea. We now think they're part of the 
slave kids that are working in diamond mines in southern Sierra Leone. But he and Bintu, the one piece of good luck is they managed to escape and meet in the same refugee camp in Ghana. And they came to our, our country, and we have befriended them. And then the last family that we've befriended and, and been with for a couple years now is the family of six Kurdish sisters. And these sisters' father was minister of culture just before Saddam Hussein came to power. And um, Hussein was killing families like theirs. So they walked first into I, uh, Iran. They were in a refugee camp that was very harsh there. For example, they had to wear what they called black curtains. And the mullahs at this camp, if they saw a woman wearing any lipstick, they'd take a ground up glass in a handkerchief and rub it, rub their lips or their, to get rid of the makeup. So they, they were in this camp for a little while. They escaped and they, they rode horses into Pakistan. Then they were in a small hut in Pakistan for seven years with the UN bringing them a food parcel every week. It's hard to describe, but these are very beautiful, bright-eyed young women, very smart, they all speak six languages, who sat in this hut in Quetta watching their youth disappear, watching their youth disappear. And finally how they got out of there was they told the UN worker, we would rather starve than stay here any longer. And so the UN worker got them out when they went on a hunger strike. They were in Islamabad, and then they flew to Lincoln, Nebraska. And I met, the youngest sister was the only one who could still go to high school, Shireen. I, I did an interview with her at the high school. I gave her my card, as I always gave refugees my card. And a couple weeks later, she called me, and she said um, she'd seen a matchbook that said if she spent $25, she could become an artist. So she called me to say, should I pay $25 and become an artist and support my family? And of course I said no. And then about a week later, she called me. She's very enterprising. She'd seen an ad that if she spent $50, she could become a supermodel. So she called to say, if I spend $50 and become a supermodel, could I support my family? And again, I said no, and I decided we'll take these young women under our wing and try to help them get used to America. And so it was a very good experience, hopefully, for them. We taught them to drive. We took them beautiful places. One of the things I think is very important for um, people who live in an area to do when, when they help a refugee is show them what's good and beautiful, because at least in the States, there are many people that will show refugees junk to make money. And so it's very important to have a kind of antidote to that. People who will say, here's where the art museums are, here's where the parks are, here's where the free musical concerts are, and so on. One time I took them to the sculpture gardens near our university. And uh, they were walking around. There was one sculpture, it was of a a woman, but she didn't have a head. She just had a kind of a point on top, and she had big breasts and hips. And these six women and their mom, who was a 14-year-old arranged bride when she was married and didn't speak, in, didn't speak English, didn't read or write in any language, the, the mother and the sisters are all just walking around looking at this statue. And finally, Shireen said to me, we know how the artists felt about women. She was very struck by that particular statue. Another time, this was just before the Bush-Gore election. I was giving them a little lesson on how American elections worked. It turned out, of course, it was a totally useless lecture in terms of <laughs> how that worked. But as I was, I was drawing a, as, as dramatic a distinction as I could for heuristic purposes between Republicans and Democrats. And as I did this in my somewhat intense, dramatic way, I noticed their eyes were getting bigger and bigger. And they were kind of looking nervously at each other. So I stopped and I said, is something wrong? Are you upset by what I'm saying? And one of the sisters said to me, if your candidate is not elected, will you and Jim be killed? 
That had been their experience. So anyway, the culture, I, I ended up naming whatever it was we did with these three families, being a cultural broker. And, and saying that increasingly in, in this new century, all of our job is going to be to be cultural brokers, to ease people into each other's cultures, to connect new people to new systems and systems to each other, and to teach refugees in general what the deal is. For example, a really good rule is the first time rule, that any time somebody has to do something like um, apply for a job or go to the health department or go to the grocery store, it's really a good idea to have a cultural broker go along for that first time. And then they will be comfortable to go back alone. The other thing I felt was very important, in, a, in the US particularly, you cannot survive in our country if you don't know how to deal with time and money. Those are the two things you've got to understand to make it in America. And there are many of the people come from cultures, for example, the Dinka from southern Sudan. They have no abstract word for time in their language. So it's very hard for them to get used to this American idea of time. For example, one time I said to Joseph, I will come by for you at 11 o'clock Sunday to give you a driving lesson. And his response to me was, you are welcome at my house anytime. Now that's good. I can go to his house anytime. He will invite me in. It's bad. If I go at 11 Sunday, he might not be there. If he has something better to do, he will be wherever he wants to be at 11 on Sunday. Another man said to me at one point, you Americans invented stress. And with globalization, you are exporting it all over the world. There's a lot of stress around getting used to a half an hour lunch. And one thing the refugees did actually at parties, would they were very careful not to be critical about America, but they would joke about Americans in time and they, they do things like they go, oh, it is 7.30, I must go eat now. Or, oh, it is eight o'clock, even though I'm having a good time, I will run to another house. You know, and they would make fun of how we are always looking at these little machines and then running off for no reason that they can tell. Uh, money was very bad too, because the refugees don't, for the most part, like a woman from Russia put it very well. She said, in Russia, everything was free unless it was labeled as costing. It's just the opposite in, in the US. Everything costs money unless it is labeled free. And for example, one time I went to the house of a Muslim man. He was on his hands and knees uh, praying and thanking Allah and going, thank you Allah, you have given me what I need, money to help my family. All my life I have prayed for money. And it turns out what he had got in the mail was a magazine sweepstake check for a million dollars. And I had to help him off his knees and say, you are not a rich man. You are not a millionaire. This is not real money. You cannot cash this check. And I actually had to do that quite a bit. I had to explain to people, there are people in our country who will lie to you to make money. This was a big problem with TV, too, because all the refugees, first thing they get in America is a television set, ostensibly to teach English. But in my opinion, really to teach shopping, to teach shopping. And of course, many of the refugees, they don't understand very well how, what to buy in America. So what happened was I would go someplace like one time to the Vietnamese Catholic Church and the babies in the nursery were ha drinking Mountain Dew in their baby bottles. Or people would buy their kids Nintendo games before they got dental appointments or tennis shoes or coats for them because their education about America was coming from the wrong places, from people who only wanted to make money from them and had no interest in helping them learn to be good intentional people in our country. In the U.S., You have to be intentional to make it. If you just let the culture happen to you, you end up rushed, stressed, addicted, and broke. 
I made a list in the book, it's five pages long, of what cultural brokers do and, and what I did. And I'll just read a few of them to give you an idea. I taught people how to walk on snow and ice, um, how to use elevators, escalators, and revolving doors, how and why to put on a bike helmet, what to store in a refrigerator, what is the lifespan of Americans, what to do when a tornado siren sounds, why I don't beat my children, what are band-aids, sanitary napkins, dental floss, and deodorant, how to check the oil in a car, how to read the one ads, call ask a nurse, and use the library, what animals Americans eat, what is daylight savings time, how to wear socks, why we shouldn't litter, and how to eat an ice cream cone. Those are all lessons. A friend of mine, Bill Holm, went to China. He's an Icelandic Minnesotan. And he taught in China for a year for a little Lutheran college. And he said after that year, I don't know what I learned about China from that year, but I learned a lot about my own country. And that's what I feel about this experience. I, the, the learning curve to, to try to understand 52 cultures was very steep. And I would never claim I'm an expert on refugee policies or the cultural traditions of the, the Dinka or anything like that. But I learned a lot about the United States. And one of the refugees actually put it the best when he said, America is the beauty and the beast. It's the beauty and the beast. And every good thing in our country can sort of be divided into, well, this is the good about that particular system, but here's, here's the beast, here's the danger with that system. For example, work. Most of the refugees come in and they do what I call 3D work, difficult, dangerous, and dirty work. They work in the big meatpacking plants that ring our town. And those plants were built for Swedes. And so particularly the, the Lao people, the Vietnamese, we have a lot of short people now working in these cold, slippery, dangerous factories with knives, with equipment that was not designed for them. And our latest statistic released on the meatpacking plants, 85% injury first year on the drop. Very dangerous work. Uh, and a lot of times the people doing that kind of work are well-educated people. They, they maybe have skills, but we don't have the credentialing processes that will allow them to move into work that would be better suited for them and, and helpful to us. For example, a friend of mine told me this story. She was, she was working some small towns in the Midwest. Literally, somebody wants to build a factory, like this particular factory was a turkey processing plant. They pick a small town, they buy the land, they throw up their factory, and they literally bring in 800 refugees to work in that family and dump them on a community. And this is what had happened in Pelican Rapids, Minnesota. And my friend was a social worker. She was out at the factory trying to help the owners of the factory sort people into who could do what. So she's going through the factory, and she's trying to figure out who can read and write. She comes up to this guy and she hands him a piece of paper that says two plus two equals to see if he could write four, gives it to him. He looks at it a minute, he takes it from her, he takes her pencil, he turns over the paper, and he writes a, about a paragraph long quadratic equation and hands it back to her. She realizes we have no idea who we're dealing with. We have no idea what the lives of these people are like. On the other hand, there's some very good work stories, like Joseph, our oldest um, Sudanese boy from Kakuma. He'd never worked. Um, he'd, he'd been institutional. He'd either been running and had a war in his eyes, or he'd been institutionalized in a camp his whole life. He comes to America at 22. He's responsible to support his three siblings. He's their legal guardian. He's got to get a job. So he's very, very nervous about this. And my husband, Jim, takes him to, we got him a pretty good job for him. It was a, a janitorial job at our hospital, but it had benefits. It had some advantages in terms of college and so on. So anyway, Jim is taking him to his, his job. He is so nervous. He's very quiet, 
kind of shaking, kind of wall-eyed with anxiety. And Jim's thinking, I really hope the person who meets him is good to him or he could have a heart attack. He is so scared. So they get to the hospital. They walk down the hall. They go to the place where the supervisor is. And um, <clears throat> they walk in. It's a, a middle-aged woman. She immediately seemed to size up this situation. And she walks up to Joseph. She takes his hands. And she says, welcome. We are honored that you are here. We are glad you will work for us. And he just, breathing change, relaxed, and it was OK. So very small things like that can make a big difference. Another thing very important to the refugees was education. The newcomers ended up having so much respect for teachers who end up being the good face of our country. Although the schools were interesting because, for example, one of the few complaints that was very consistent across traditional refugee cultures in our town is how little respect Americans have for teachers, how kids are mouthy in class, and also how American kids speak badly of their parents. And for example, the Vietnamese have a norm that if you are even, as a child or, or as an adult, if you are even with someone that speaks badly of their family, you must walk away from that person. That it's disloyal to talk to someone who's speaking badly of their family. So as you can imagine, they were pretty amazed by how American kids sometimes speak to teachers and sometimes speak to their families. When I did interviews with the refugee kids, I would say, the high school kids, I would say, now that you're in America, what is your dream? And it was amazing the number of kids who said, I want to go to college or I want to get a good job so I can buy my parents a house or so I can make money to give my family or so I can make money to send my brothers and sisters to college. I will work in the meatpacking plant with my father so my younger brother can go to college. And it was, um, it was, it was refreshing to hear, but it was frustrating too because even though we have a kind of lip service to cross-cultural education and multiculturalism, it's very superficial. And one of the things that hit me is the American kids passing these refugee kids in the hall, they have no idea what their experiences are. They have no idea that some boy without an arm doesn't have an arm because a lion ate his arm when he was walking across Sudan. Or that some Kurdish boy was a, was a goat herd in Kurdistan who led his parents across a mountain path to freedom or whatever. They have no idea. In fact, one of the Bosnian boys, Boris, told me that the only time the American kids talked to him was they wanted to know how to say swear words in his language. They'd ask him how to say certain words. And he was very proud of that, actually, because he foiled them by teaching them to say words like butterfly in his language. And then he would like mock them for going around saying these words. But um, one time I was in an ESL class at the high school, and a Ukrainian girl named Oksana started to cry. And it turned out that morning, her family had called her relatives in the Ukraine. They have a cell phone, and they called her relatives and her relatives told her, we are eating grass. We are going out into the, the fields like cattle and eating grass. We have no food. And she started to cry talking about this. And then all the refugee kids jumped in, and they started to talk about, it turns out a good share of them worked at a place called Buffy's Buffet in our town. They started to talk about all the food that Americans waste and how horrified they are by the enormous portions of food we eat that could feed a whole family. And even one woman, one young woman, was very angry because her sister had brought home art made out of beans and pasta. And she thought, it is so disrespectful to make art out of food when people are hungry. And I was thinking as I listened to these kids, I wish American kids could hear this. I wish we had more vehicles to connect 
these experiences with our, our sort of ordinary American teenagers. Um, in fact, one of the things I, I thought a lot doing this project was I, I called it a split world experience where I'd maybe go to a graduation party with some of my middle class friends and we'd have you know, beautiful food and flowers and, and music and, and a nice house and people would be talking about their summer vacations or whatever. And then once on, on the way home from a party like that, I stopped at Mohammed and Bintu's house and they had just heard that some friends of theirs were starving in Ghana. And when I expressed dismay about that, they just looked at me very matter-of-factly and said, everyone will starve if we don't get them out. Everyone will starve in that camp. As if, how could I not know that? How could I not know that? And I also thought about that, not only um, the, the place business and how much disparity there is between my life and the lives of so many people who are without question as worthy of me of having three meals a day and health care and so on. But I also about th thought about the time dimension and how all these years, these lovely Kurdish sisters who are part of our family now were living in this hut in Quetta. My family was going backpacking and on picnics and reading good books and having potluck dinners with our friends. And it almost seemed like these realities couldn't be existing in the same place. Um, and in fact, we, we sort of developed a joke about this. Um, there was a New Yorker cartoon that shows two yuppies and they're in a kind of a SUV and they're saying, oh no, I spilled cappuccino on my down vest. And so we started, like when we'd complain about little things, my husband and I started saying to each other, oh, did you spill cappuccino on your down vest? As a way to say, cut that out. You know, we don't have the right for this kind of complaints right now in the world the way, the way it is. So this whole experience, it, it made me a, a much more, it made me much more aware of other people's point of view. For example, one time I was talking to uh, some Iraqi men, and, and they, were, they were saying, we do not understand American men. They do not respect women. Iraqi men respect women. American men are terrible to women. Now, this was very interesting to me, because American men in my town would most likely say the exact opposite thing. And so I asked these Iraqi men, these, these three guys, um, where, where do you get this idea? Why do, what's your evidence for that? It turns out they work in a factory, and on Monday morning, all these American factory worker guys come in, and they brag about going to the bars, picking up women, having sex. They brag maybe about some woman getting pregnant and they didn't marry her. These Iraqi men were almost in tears. They're going, we would be honored if a woman would give us her companionship we would never abandon a child. All that we wish for is the opportunity to be a husband. So from their point of view, America was a very cruel place for women. Just, it was just interesting to me how different points of view people could have all of a sudden in our town. And I, I, became, I, I, I became fonder of our country in a way. For example, I, I really started appreciating just very basic things, like everybody gets to go to school in America. Women, men, girls, boys. And I, and I appreciated the freedom of movement we have and the freedom I have to stand up here and talk about these things. On the other hand, we make it very difficult for the refugees. For example, ironically, our last wave of refugees before September 11th was Afghanis, mainly widows, coming in with eight or ten kids they don't read or write. They got married as 12, 13-year-old women. They've never been around men that weren't in their family. They don't drive. They've never worked outside the home. Many of them are very traumatized. They have health problems. Within a very short time, we expect them to be working in the dog food plants for minimum wage, supporting their eight kids. And this is a little-known fact. We expect all our refugees to pay back their plane tickets. So a woman with eight kids is playing back nine plane tickets from um, Kabul or wherever she ends up having flown from. 
So it's a very, I, I have much more complex feelings about what our country does and doesn't do for newcomers. The other thing I, I want to speak briefly about is, is, is what I observed about healing, working with the refugees. I, I feel like if before I wrote this book, I knew this much about human suffering, I, I now know this much. I, I feel like I got a PhD in suffering, in a sense. And um, my whole idea of what humans would do to each other and for each other has expanded. For example, I met a woman who had lost 22 family members in Srebrenica. Uh, they'd all been, that was a terrible time in Srebrenica. And she said, when I met her, she said, the pain has killed my heart. But after I got to know her a while, I asked her what I always ask refugees, which is, in spite of the terrible things that happened to you, in any way did you learn? Now, no refugee ever said no to that question. And this woman's answer to that question was, yes, I learned that people are good. And she went on to tell a story that after the men and all the men in her family had been killed, she was, she was crossing a border by herself. A corrupt border guard was not going to let her pass. And um, the man behind her, a perfect stranger, stepped up, opened up his wallet, gave her half his money, and said, if you take half and I take half, we'll be able to get across this border. So that's, how, that's what her evidence was, that, that humans were good. In fact, one of the things that happened was when I first met refugees, I was struck by their, their victim status, the, the terrible suffering they'd experienced. But by the time I'd, I'd been in this research project for three years, what I was really struck by was the resilience the human, uh, the human has and how people, even Mohammed and Bintu, after their families, after, after seeing their children taken, after seeing uh, Mohammed's family killed, are somehow able to, to pick up and go on. And one of the ways they do it is, and, and Mohammed and Bintu are a very good example of this, they develop a sense of purpose. They develop a, a new reason to go on. So for example, while Mohammed and Bintu were in that refugee camp in Ghana, they, they met a whole bunch of kids who'd been orphaned in Freetown. And they kind of adopted these eight kids. And as soon as Mohammed got his first paycheck in the States, he bought a $200 money order, sent it back to Ghana to the camp, so the kids would have rice and milk for a while. And he and Bintu are working on getting the children over here. So they have a reason to get up, a reason to keep on living. They have people to take care of. Otherwise, I don't think they could have survived what happened to them. LBJ, of all people, said, let's hope the world doesn't narrow into a neighborhood before it broadens into a brotherhood. And um, we're becoming a neighborhood. One in five kids in the elementary schools in the United States is, is foreign born. I like to think it's becoming a global village, but I, in actuality, to be honest, I think it's a global shopping mall. I don't think it's even close to being a village. And one of the things I wanted to do with this book is, is I wanted to help Americans understand um, First of all, the experiences of other people in other parts of the world. Um, I think, in general, Americans are woefully ignorant about the world. Daniel Shore has a good line. He says, war is how Americans learn geography. And that's very true about people in our country. The other thing I, I think we Americans really need to learn is how other people see us. So I tried to tell a lot of stories in this book about how People from Cameroon or Afghanistan or Albanian Muslims see people in the United States in the hopes that will make us be wiser and more 
intelligent in our decisions about how to relate to the rest of the world. Finally, I, I love this line by Stanley Crouch. He said, civilization can be boiled down to one word, welcome. Welcome is a very important word. Whenever I met refugees, I learned to say, welcome. I'm glad you're in the country. And I'll tell you one last welcome story and then um, stop. I was at the health department with a Sudanese woman named Pamela. She's about six foot, three inches tall, very, very black, a Dinka woman. She had a top knot that made her a couple inches taller. And she had on a red and white polka dot African dress with purple Nikes. And she was eight and a half months pregnant. So she was a very striking looking woman. And we'd gone there. The health department's another place I learned about where people go who don't have money for private medical care in the States. And the, the staff is pretty good, but they're just overwhelmed. And so we take a number, we're number 72, we're in this stuffy little waiting room that fills up. We wait for hours. People just start unraveling. You know, the old people start looking very tired. The, the kids start whining and getting in trouble. The parents start getting really crabby with their kids. And, and I'm starting to look at my watch and thinking, why did I agree to bring Pamela? I'm wasting an entire afternoon here. She's just getting a prenatal check. I just wish we'd blown this off and, and so on and so on. And meanwhile, we're up to about 63. It's going to be another half an hour probably before we get in. And there's a little toddler probably a Lao, probably Lao, maybe Vietnamese, toddler, who sees Pamela. And she, she kind of toddles over to her, and she stares at her very intently. And at first it's kind of cute, but then she stares at her too long. She's just staring really intently. And it's, it's, it's a strong enough stare that the entire room gradually goes quiet and everybody starts watching. And it's, it actually was very uncomfortable. I was thinking, this could be a bad situation. Pamela could be hurt. And I was already, being a therapist and being who I am, thinking, how can I spin this if this toddler does something rude to Pamela so that it won't be too bad for her? So anyway, meanwhile, I, like everyone else, am watching this little toddler. And the toddler's looking at Pamela. Pamela is sort of wiggling around and looking at the toddler. All of a sudden, the little girl breaks into a big smile and goes, whew, blows her a kiss. The whole room just breathed a collective sigh of relief and laughed, and laughed. It was very funny at that moment, as tense things always are afterwards, if you're lucky, very funny. And I thought that experience... It's a metaphor for all of our experience, for my experience with refugees, for all of our experience. When we meet people very different from ourselves, we, we don't know if they're like us or not. If we look for differences, we find differences. There are differences. If we look for similarities, we find similarities. But if we work hard at finding that commonality, it's there. And, and when we find it, there's this snap of joy. There's this real sense of peace that comes with that, that feeling. So I, I guess that's what I would like to uh, leave you with. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.